Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome friends to this third and concluding lecture on Ram Manohar Lohia. In this lecture we are going to focus on his views and um, his uh, proposition or his solution to the uh, emotionally charged and politically contentious issue of language problem in India. So, today in this lecture we will discuss his views on uh, language, the kind of solution he was uh, providing and how the issue of language for Lohia is part of more than a cultural or the question of identity and how he related it with the question of democratization, social equality and empowerment of the uh, masses. So, uh, Lohia took uh, the issue of language in the broader context of democratization and social, uh, social equality uh, in India. So, uh, he did not uh, see or studied the language problem in its isolation. He saw it in the connection with the other problem that was uh, there in, um, uh, in post-independent India. And here it is also to recall the kind of intersectionalist approach that he, uh, he had uh, about the politics, about uh, and how that can be overcome by looking at simultaneously different uh, interconnected problem be it caste, class, gender, language, etc. So, Lohia has a kind of broader uh, approach towards uh, uh, the politics. So, in this lecture we are going to focus primarily on his views on Indian language. So, uh, Lohia's approach to Indian languages was integral to his philosophy or his understanding of a kind of different or distinct brand of Indian nationalism, uh, Indian socialism that he was arguing. And he did not approach the problem of language as a separate or isolated issue in India. So, as uh, he was a culturally sensitive and a rooted political activist, he understood how English language excluded the millions of Indians speaking Indian languages from the corridors or positions of power. So, Lohia did understand the language or domination of English and uh, it is uh, not correct uh, to brand him as a kind of chauvinist linguistic figure, but to see his uh, philosophy about language or his support for Indian language in the larger context where uh, for uh, Lohia any kind of domination or hegemony of one over the other was problematic and need to be opposed or um, dismantled. And his opposition to English language was in continuous and uh, in continuity with such kind of uh, uh, views and politics. So, uh, Lohia as himself was a kind of culturally sensitive. So, he understood the social and the cultural value of different languages in India. At the same time, he was also aware of how a particular language, say in the context of India, English prevented a large number of masses, millions of Indians who used to speak their mother tongue, different uh, uh, Indian languages, modern Indian languages were excluded from the corridors of power because of their inability to understand or speak a foreign language. And that is the basis of his uh, uh, larger criticism 
to uh, the domination of English language rather than the language form or the English language per se. That was the basis of his criticism and also uh, the other criticism that he had against the domination of English was it also damaged the Indian political thought and reduced it merely to a kind of derivative thinking. So, you may be aware of a kind of um, uh, borrowing of ideas, concepts, themes and methods to explain and uh, interpret Indian society. And in the beginning of this uh, course, we have also talked about how Indian political thought and more critical engagement with the modern Indian political thought enable us to develop or to uh, identify the concepts, themes and method through which we can better explain Indian society and not by merely borrowing the terms, concepts and methods from the um, um, other soils or the uh, foreign, uh, um, uh, foreign origin. So, um, uh, Lohia besides this uh, domination of uh, English language in terms of excluding the millions uh, who speak uh, their uh, respective mother tongues or Indian languages from the corridors or positions of power, English language also damaged the uh, political thought, Indian political thought by reducing it to a form of merely derivative thinking, where we borrow the concepts, ideas and methods from uh, say West or say European countries or some other uh, foreign, uh, foreign soils and then try to apply it to understand, explain and Indian, uh, interpret Indian society. So, Lohia was against that kind of derivative thinking also. So, to uh, support Indian languages for Lohia was also to strengthen, to assert the independence or the capability or competence of uh, Indian um, uh, uh, in a way. Uh, the text I have told you to read, uh, Swaraj in idea in terms of thinking how one can apply one's own theories, concepts independently from any kind of uh, derivation or borrowing from other uh, others. Also, as uh, Lohia's uh, support or support for Indian language and opposition to English was also to do with this strengthening of uh, Indian languages and Indian political thought and rescuing it from a kind of derivative mode of uh, thinking. And therefore, he considered removal of English as a major problem for Indian democracy. So, this is for Lohia the biggest problem and um, to free oneself from uh, domination, not uh, merely the political or the physical material sense of the term, but also cognitively in terms of thinking how one is uh, free and independent to uh, to understand, to explain, to uh, then provide solution to the various challenges that a country or a society is facing. So, for uh, Lohia this kind of a uh, derivative mode of thinking will not be able to solve the various challenges that Indian democracy was facing and therefore, for uh, Lohia then the uh, challenges of, or the biggest problem or challenge for Indian democracy is then the removal of English and then he provided he, uh, the leadership to the Angreji Hatao um, or banished English movement, especially in North India if you are familiar uh, that uh, in the Hindi heartland this movement has, uh, uh, has enormous uh, strength immediately after the post independent India, especially during the first and second decades of the uh, post independent India. So, Lohia provided uh, the leadership to this Angreji Hatao movement, which uh, became a kind of basis for uh, the socialist politics that he was um, involved in and made it one of the most significant agendas of socialist politics in post independent India. So, it is to the credit of Lohia that he made the issue of language as the most significant agenda for the, uh, for the uh, 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 socialist politics in post independent India. And in place of English, he wanted Hindi or Hindustani to become the lingua franca of the country. So, during that kind of situation or circumstances, uh, so uh, uh, there was this uh, trend of thinking about a lingua, a lingua franca 
which English provided for a very long time when uh, there was a um, um, uh, debate or uh, there was a growing consciousness or what we call Indian Renaissance. So, different provinces speaking their respective languages coming together and forming Indian nationhood or uh, uh, um, uh, discussing their challenges, English provided that kind of uh, link language to the nationalist uh, leadership. So, in place of that, um, Lohia was arguing for Hindu, Hindi or Hindustani to be the lingua franca of the country. However, on the basis of this uh, suggestion to make Hindi or Hindustani as the lingua franca of the country, many people argue that Lohia was uh, discriminating against many other Indian languages while he was opposing the domination of English. And we are all aware of the uh, strength or the use or pervasive use of English in every sphere of our life, be it politics, culture, education, every sphere almost. So, English is, is become a kind of all pervasive language and there is a kind of continuous tussle between the uh, Indian languages. Uh, and uh, English language and in many ways English is now being Indianized in so many ways. So, uh, the um, right approach to understand this issue is not to pit one language against the other, but to understand the inherent hierarchy, domination or subordination that is inbuilt in this kind of linguistic uh, uh, assertion. So, uh, because uh, Lohia promoted or uh, uh, wanted Hindi to be uh, the lingua franca of the country, it will be wrong for us to argue that he was against the English as a language per se. So, that is not the correct way to um, argue about Lohia's uh, views on language. So, he has nothing uh, against a language per se, but against the privilege, against the uh, power that it uh, provides to a section of Indian uh, population and marginalizes and excluded a larger uh, uh, population because of their inability to speak or understand that language. So, uh, uh, so it will be wrong to argue that he was against the English as a language per se or he was privileging Hindi over the other Indian languages. So, as we will discuss later, in fact, uh, we find in Lohia a great champion or supporter of Indian languages and he wanted Indian languages to flourish, to establish its independence and its capacity to think all complex issues and challenges that a country as a whole uh, was facing. So, uh, Lohia's um, approach to the question of language was not to do with the uh, uh, language per se, but how it marginalizes, how it subordinates a larger section of uh, uh, Indian uh, population because of their inability to think, speak and understand a language which is foreign in ori uh, origin and that makes him a kind of um, uh, opponent of English, um, English uh, language in India. So, uh, Lohia also recognized the language was not merely as a tool of communication, but more importantly an aspect of self-identity and expression for different uh, linguistic community. So, it is important to note that Lohia did not put forward a conventional and uncomplicated mother tongue argument. So, there is a kind of consensus around the use about the use of mother tongue as a medium of instruction or a primary. Um, languages for a child to learn, languages for a child to learn before he or she goes on to uh, speak or learn other languages. So, Lohia was not giving that kind of a straightforward simplistic argument, conventional argument about the mother tongue. Instead, he saw the language question as a important social and cultural issue in India and he argued that the basic question involved is what is modernity? So, uh, in Lohia it is also uh, necessary to see the interlinkages that he was uh, uh, trying to, uh, to uh, construct between the question of caste and class to the question of gender to the question of language and how 
these all create a kind of um, hierarchy between the ruling class and the larger population and how to make democracy uh, more uh, empowering to those who are excluded from the uh, privileged uh, class or uh, the corridors of power and that is something which um, Lohia trying to uh, argue for through his understanding of uh, modernity and the questions of modernity. So, he, uh, the complexities in his argument is about the interconnections between different uh, categories be it caste, class, gender or language. So, the basic question involved is what is the uh, what is modernity? Is it such a thing which could come only through English? So, many people will argue that um, modernity in India and the modern uh, thinking or modern institution, modern uh, practices, modern uh, lifestyles uh, comes only through English language. Modernism, Lohi argues, is an attitude towards men and matters that today's men have developed with the advance of science and technology, an attitude fundamentally based on reason, knowledge and truth and not on sentiments, superstitions and orthodoxy. So, there is, he is making a kind of distinction between what it uh, takes to uh, uh, consider something as modern and something which is not modern or which is merely uh, orthodox or superstitious. So, it is a dynamic and not dogmatic approach to the question of human involvement. To an Indian, English does not provide this. So, for most of the Indians who and uh, 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 even in contemporary times, there are a very small section of Indian population who can speak uh, or uh, understand uh, English. But think about 1950s and 60s uh, where they were uh, getting the political rights, but their understanding of such rights, their involvement with uh, 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 such uh, political development was very uh, different and then to consider English then as a vehicle for modernity in India was a kind of hypocrisy for, um, for Lohia. So, he argued to an Indian this kind of uh, reason, knowledge, truth or dynamism needs to be developed in their own languages, in their own particular mother tongues. So, if someone argued that English provides such kind of vehicle, such kind of platform for thinking about science and uh, knowledge. Then uh, he argues that it besets him with hypocrisy. It turns an Indian into a bundle of complexes, a man with no human personality, and imitating headless monkey. So that's the kind of uh, philosophical argument that Lohia is making here. So uh, and there is also then in Lohia's thought and philosophy the possibility of thinking about modernity in a different way then many people, many scholars have been arguing about the role of colonial uh, intervention, their, um, uh, 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 their institution buildings or uh, the language or the education system that they provided, that should be the basis of um, or that is considered as the um, provider or a kind of um, uh, facilitator of modernity in India. Lohia was arguing in a very, uh, very different way or distinct way to understand Indian modernity or to bring about modernity in India by, uh, by bringing science, technology, truth, dynamism through Indian languages and not merely through the vehicle of English as many people have been arguing. So, his uh, plea for banishment of English was mainly aimed at dislodging English from its privileged position as the lingua franca of the elite, not of the masses, as the de facto official language of the country and as the medium of instruction in the educational institution. So, uh, Lohia's opposition to English language is based on these three uh, uh, regions or three uh, um, uh, reason was uh, uh, for him to oppose uh, uh, English as a language of domination in India. And why English has a privileged position? The first is that it provided a kind of lingua franca of the elite 
and not of the masses. Masses still speaks in their mother tongues in their provincial languages. So Lohia your position to uh, English language is based on these three uh, criteria. One was uh, that English acquired its privileged position because it is the lingua franca of the elite. And here the point that we need to stress is, is the lingua franca of the elite and not of the masses. Masses still speaks their mother tongues, their provincial language and find it difficult to understand or comprehend English as a language. So, immediately then the English and uh, in ability to speak English uh, gives a person in India a kind of privileged position. So, uh, uh, his opposition to English is because it is the lingua franca of the elite and not of the masses. As the de facto official language of the country, so there are besides English, there is Hindi and many other languages which is the official language, but de facto in practice, it is the English which is the official language of the country and that is why uh, he was critical or uh, he was opposing the domination of uh, a foreign language English. Uh, as the official language of independent India and also as a medium of instruction in educational institutions. So, English has the kind of unmatched position in academia or in the educational institution. So, so in terms of thought as we have been arguing that we do not uh, seriously engage with the, with the um, uh, Indian languages and how these languages uh, tries to uh, engage with some of the uh, modern ideas and this is something which I have also uh, discussed in my introductory lecture and in my concluding lecture also I will uh, briefly discuss uh, this uh, issue of how to expand the uh, boundary of modern thinking and thought uh, to include different provincial languages within its, uh, its domain. So, on these three basis uh, low here. Um, 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 uh, was very critical of uh, the privileged position of English in India. And he opposed English in independent India not because it was a foreign language. So, the other uh, uh, points that we need to stress is his opposition to English is not because it is foreign origin, but because it was in Indian context a vehicle of inequality and cultural heteronomy. So, uh, his opposition to English is not because it is a foreign language, but in Indian context, English is a vehicle of social inequality or uh, cultural heteronomy. So, which divides between the uh, different cultures, different uh, languages, different community and that is why he was opposing the uh, English language and its uh, domination which, um, which is a vehicle of inequality and cultural heteronomy. So, Lohia along with many other nationalists then believed that putting English in its place required a powerful Indian language that could substitute it as the national lingua franca and therefore, he supported Hindi or Hindustani uh, to be the lingua franca of the country. And precisely because of his support, to Hindi as the nest, uh, as the lingua franca in the country, Lohia is also regarded by many scholars merely as a linguistic chauvinist or a Hindi jealous who, uh, who was trying to privilege Hindi over many other Indian languages in his critique or in his opposition to English language. But that is not the case which we will come uh, uh, to discuss in a minute. Now, many scholars have also argued that Lohia's search for a language that could take on English led him to believe that a very wide range of languages could be subsumed under Hindi or Hindustani and that the speakers of all these languages could be persuaded to use Nagari script in writing their uh, respecting language. So, the languages that Lohia was uh, arguing to be subsumed within uh, the Hindi or Hindustani was say Punjabi or Gujarati and such like others which can be uh, subsumed within the um, uh, Hindi or Hindust uh, Hindustani language. And Lohia is a very kind of uh, problematic understanding uh, here and in contemporary times um, it is uh, not uh, right to argue perhaps for the subs 
subsuming of a um, rich language like Punjabi or uh, uh, or Gujarati, and many people do criticize him because of this kind of argument that he was putting forth. So, he came up with three different proposals to address the sensibilities and concerns of the non-Hindi speakers and to convince them to support his Banish English campaign or Angreji Hatao Andolan. So, first he proposed Hindi as the official language of the central government with all the central government jobs reserved for non-Hindi speakers at least for a specific period of time to enable them to learn uh, learn Hindi. His alternative proposal was there should be two groups of states and one would abolish English both internally and from external uh, communication and the other group could retain English to communicate with the central government, but internally they will uh, not use or abolish the use of uh, English and promote their provincial language or the native language. And finally, he suggested a multilingual which sense which is by excluding English uh, at the central level. So, now these three proposition first is about the use of Hindi, second which talks about two kind of states where one kind of states will exclude uh, English from both its internal and external communication especially the Hindi speaking state and non-Hindi speaking states he wanted uh, English to be used in uh, their communication with the external, uh, uh, external uh, uh, institutions such as center or some other bodies, but internally they must promote their own provincial languages. And finally, which becomes more acceptable proposition is uh, a kind of multilingual center which will promote all the languages. And in a way, we, if we look at the trajectory of post-independent Indian state, we have now 22 scheduled languages and there is no one. Uh, one national language or one official language. All these languages can be used for official purposes in, in different states. But another point is that English remains the de facto official language of the state and that becomes the challenge. And initially after the independence, there was a kind of heated debate and exchanges on the issue of language and what should be the official language of the country. So, in such context, Lohia had this three proposition which we have just explained. Now, Lohia argued that English does not harm India so much because it is foreign, but because it is in the feudal Indian context. right? So, uh, uh, the harm or the capacity to do harm of English in India is not because it is a foreign language, but because the context or the society uh, which we have in India is highly feudal. Now, in that society, there is a kind of privileged or those who are marginalized or suppressed and uh, their language, a particular form of language was strengthening such privilege or uh, exclusion or marginalization and that was the problematic, uh, uh, problematic uh, thing for Lohia and therefore, he opposed uh, English. So, he uh, writes that only a teeny, uh, tiny minority of 1 percent of the population achieve such efficiency in the language to be able to use it for power or profit. To this tiny minority, English is an instrument of domination and exploitation over the vast masses who cannot speak that language as efficiently as they can. And when we say banish English, we certainly do not wish to banish it from England or America nor even from India's colleges, it is, uh, if it is an optional subject. There is no question of banishing it from the library. So, uh, it will be wrong for us to argue that he was against learning of English language or against the use of English language per se. But his opposition to English was because it strengthened those who are privileged, those who are exploiting or marginalizing the vast masses of Indian population who cannot speak that uh, language. And that is the basis of his Angreji Hatao Andolan or Banish English movement. 
So, Lohia asked for a school instruction to be provided in the mother tongue as it, uh, there have been universal consensus on this, but insisted that children must in addition to their mother tongues learn at least two other languages and in that two other languages one should be Hindi and the other should be either a foreign language or any other Indian languages. So, he had this kind of three language formula where the primary language should be the mother tongue, but besides that all the children should be uh, taught at least two languages where one should be Hindi and the second should be either a foreign language or any other Indian language. So, he saw the need for an international language to be used in communication between nations, but was not convinced that this language for uh, communication in the international arena should always be English. It can be any other language, French or Chinese or maybe even Russian. So, he was against privileging English as the only uh, language for international communication as well. So, some scholars therefore argue that Lohia clarified repeatedly that he was for removal of English and not for the establishment of Hindi, because for him the real question was feudal language in India versus the people's language. So, uh, in his approach to the language problem what we find is Lohia was uncompromising, very clear about his opposition to the removal uh, to English or its removal from the um, um, privileged position in Indian society and um, Indian polity. But whether that should lead to establishment of Hindi, here we see a kind of um, ambiguity in Lohia's approach where we find him more accommodative, more, uh, more flexible. So, Lohia argued that the war of the socialist party on English is for the sake of the mother tongue, which means Uriya, Bengali, Tamil and Telugu as much as Hindi. So, it is not about privileging Hindi over any other Indian language. He wanted Indian languages to be uh, strengthened, to have more uh, say or uh, contribution in our official and public political discourse in place of um, uh, in place of English and there that Indian language need not to be Hindi and uh, here is the catch because during that time there was a kind of belief that there has to be one lingua, fr uh, lingua franca which should replace the uh, English. But um, now we uh, increasingly believe that the multilingual uh, country like India can uh, well communicate or um, uh, exchange the ideas or um, their um, thought by speaking, by using more and more their own uh, provincial language. And uh, Lohia increasingly uh, tried to accommodate such kind of multilingual scene rather than replacing one uh, mono language to the other mono language be it Hindi or any other Indian language. So, the focus of much of his writing was on how the dominance of English has led to loss of self confidence and unequal opportunities for the masses and has dwarfed the Indian mind. So, there is a kind of uh, damage to the emergence or the development of Indian political thought also because of such domination. So, he argued passionately that Indian languages, not just Hindi, are adequate for that task uh, for modern society or polity and can be further refined if we start using them in our public spaces. So, he identified state patronage and school education as the key for the rejuvenation of Indian language and therefore, how uh, Indian language can be promoted and strengthened when there is a state patronage to it, when there is a kind of school education in Indian uh, languages. And all these concerns were not confined merely in Lohia's writings, 
but also appeared in the resolution that was passed by the Angreji Hatta Sammelans that he instituted. So, Lohia through his writings, through his political activities was increasingly championing the cause of Indian languages which is not uh, to be understood only as Hindi or, uh, or uh, Hindustani and there uh, many scholars have, uh, have uh, wrongly uh, reduced Lohia's approach merely as a kind of supporter of Hindi or a linguistic chauvinist. But actually Lohia was trying to um, argue or uh, support the cause of all the uh, Indian languages and uh, as um, Hindi as he was doing for Hindi. So, uh, while Lohia was, uh, so what we find in Lohia is while he was uncompromising in his opposition to English, he was always open to correction and accommodation regarding his views on Indian languages. So, there we see a shift in his uh, uh, position about Indian languages, especially about the role of Hindi. So, precisely because it was a second order question that what should be the replacement. So, English should be removed, but what we should replace English with? Here we find uh, Lohia more accommodative, more flexible and this is a kind of second order question. So, there was ambivalence and subtle shifts in Lohia's thinking about this question and it is interesting to argue that Lohia began with the proposition that Hindustani should be the language of the union but moved to a two department thesis involving a bifurcation of Hindi and non-Hindi sections in the government and finally came to advocate a multilingual center involving all the then 14 official languages of the uh, republic. So, later on he used to often remark, let Hindi go to hell in his remarks. So, we see a kind of clear shifts from making Hindi as a lingua franca of the country to a kind of two um, department thesis and then finally supporting the multilingual center. So, therefore, we can say that Lohia was in support of all the Indian languages for the promotion of all the Indian languages and not just uh, Hindi. So, um, now to summarize uh, the core arguments of Lohia's on language, one can do it through this two quotation from Lohia and first is about English and then the second is about the language policy of the state and which language needs to be promoted. So, about English he writes, it is now impossible to banish the public use of English without the desire of the people. The policy of removal of English gradually which has been adopted by the government of India is proving more dangerous than the policy of retaining English forever. So, the chief problem is the removal of English and not the establishment of Hindi. So, that is uh, again uh, very clear in his writings. So, this clarification is necessary for the non-Hindi speaking states like Mysore, Bengal, Tamil Nadu should have the option not to use Hindi at all. They may use their own languages, but they also must remove English. So, uh, the greater attention and the more focus of Lohia is to remove English that is the bigger challenge than the establishment of Hindi. So, he wanted to promote and not to use English uh, Hindi at all by the non-Hindi speaking uh, Indian states, but it is necessary to remove English uh, uh, from its power uh, position of uh, privilege and domination. The second quote is about the language policy. So, a correct language policy has to be evolved. Hindi should be the language of the central government. Immediately after the gadgeted post of the central government should be reserved for the non-Hindi speaking areas for 10 years. The center should correspond with states in Hindi and the states should correspond with the center in their regional languages until such time they learn Hindi. The medium of education up to graduate course should be the regional language and the for postgraduate studies it should be Hindi. The district judge and magistrate 
may use their regional languages where as the Hindi, uh, the High Court and the Supreme Court should use Hindustani. The speeches in Lok Sabha should generally be made in Hindustani, but members who do not know Hindi may speak their own language. Although it is a correct language policy, any state or its government which may not like to adopt this policy and wishes to continue with its regional language should have the freedom to do so. Now, uh, this is very comprehensive uh, approach to the whole issue of language and language policy of the state. So, it should not be objected to although it will be a regrettable situation. I believe this is a temporary difficulty. Therefore, keeping in view the pernicious propaganda and interest of the nation, the chief aim of our movement, uh, Angreji Hatta Andolan, should be removal of English and not the establishment of Hindi. It is certain that Hindi shall be established on an all India level in due course. Established as an established on all India level in due course, but if in some states or even on the all India level Marathi or Bengali is uh, established, we should not mind it. So, that is a kind of openness or a competitive approach to other Indian languages in his views on language, but one uncompromising stand that he has is about the removal of English and that is to not to do with the uh, language per se, but the kind of uh, privileged position, the kind of domination it enables to its uh, speaker in a society which is uh, highly uh, uh, feudal society like India. So, there the issue of language is connected to the issue of social equality and to the larger question of democratization and therefore, uh, he was against the kind of privileged status that English language provides to a few section of Indian society at the cost of the larger masses which are uh, who are uh, who are excluded from the um, corridors, uh, corridors of power. So, in this quote again we have seen the kind of proposition he was making about Hindi at the same time the objective was not to establish Hindi as the uh, uh, as the national language. Of course, it is desirable, but the main uh, objective of the whole movement he was trying to um, uh, provide leadership to is to uh, remove English from its position of domination. So, thus one can summarize his views on Indian language in following points. One. Lohia allows state governments the freedom to correspondent in their own regional language until they learn Hindi. 2. In return for this, non-Hindi states are to be provided with reservation. So, the midlands, so Lohia also makes the distinction between the midlands and the coastlands. So, in midlands he wanted, uh, he thought that Hindi can be easily promoted as the official language, but in the coastland one needs to be cautious about promoting Hindi. So, uh, he writes that the midlands must immediately operate through the Hindi department in Delhi. If Gujarat and Maharashtra and any other states opt to join the Hindustani department, they should be gratefully welcomed with whatever reservation in the services and the like they desire. So, that is the uh, second point we can draw from Lohia's position on language. And thirdly, Lohia thought the promotion or propagation of Hindi must be temporarily suspended, but this is only a tactical retreat to achieve a strategic victory. The effort to persuade the coastlands to accept Hindi must be given up, for it only leads to further irritation and contestations among the non-Hindi speakers. So, according to Lohia, once the coastlands abandon English, at the provincial level including the high court, the university and the secretariat and all such public institution, it would be only a matter of time when they apply for admission into the Hindi world. So, that is the gradual 
strategy for the promotion of Hindi among the non uh, Hindi speaking uh, regions that Lohia is arguing about. So, uh, to avoid the irritation and contestation, um, he wanted uh, the government or the st Indian state to suspend the promotion of Hindi in such a region, but then wanted those regions to promote their own provincial language and gradually they will learn Hindi and uh, Hindi turn out to be the lingua franca of the country. So, Lohia's position on Indian language illustrates something more general about his approach to politics. For Lohia, politics was a means for the empowerment of the masses which can be done only when it is conducted in the language of the people and not of the elite as English or any other foreign language. So, however, these aspects of his politics and thought have remained somewhat under theorized even to this. So, when one speaks or think or uh, argue about Lohia's views on politics, uh, uh, the um, subtle or invisible aspects of his um, critique to English uh, language uh, is somewhat uh, ignored or undermined or untheorized, which we need to focus more. So, here uh, in his opposition to English um, and support for Hindi is seen merely as a kind of linguistic chauvinist which is uh, far from truth. For Lohia, the politics is about the empowerment of the masses. That empowerment of the masses cannot happen unless the politics is carried out in the language that masses understand and that is something which we need to focus when we think about on the issue of language. Now, to conclude this lecture on Lohia's views on language, we find his views on language deeply intertwined with the kind of socialist politics. So, the intersection of caste, class, gender and language is there in Lohia's uh, thought and the kind of socialist politics that he was championing or trying to pursue in India. As he was trying to evolve an indigenous model or distinct model of socialism in India, the question of language becomes much more for Lohia than merely as a marker of cultural identity or such thing. So, he connected the question of language with the question of democratization and social equality in India. So, the question of language and language problem is much more than a question of identity or cultural expression. So, however, there have been shifts in Lohia's position on language issue in India, where we have seen from Hindi, Hindustani to support for the two uh, department thesis and then a kind of multilingual center that we have seen in Lohia. Scholars like Yogendra Yadav have argued that Lohia was wrong in emphasizing on the need for a only one singular mono language as a powerful link language to replace English as a lingua franca in India. So, perhaps the, uh, these our scholars argue the right direction would have been to look for a multilingual solution which was there in any case in Lohia's proposition as a multilingual center. So, Yogendra Yadav even goes on to express that perhaps the Indianized English can be an ally of the Indian languages in their struggle against the English. English as a language which gives a kind of privileged position in comparison to someone speaking or doing or thinking or writing in any of the Indian languages. So, a kind of Indianized English can be a ally of Indian languages to fight the English as the language of domination or the language of privileged class in India. So, in academia or among the scholars, there have been a kind of conspicuous silence regarding the politics and thought of Ram Manohar Lahia except by his loyal followers. Now, even among the loyal followers, what we find is that there are lack of critical engagement with his thoughts and ideals as one of his close associate Kishan Patnayak has argued that his followers can be neatly divided into those who ineffectively repeat his aphorisms in a disconnected manner and those who parade their loyalty to Lohia only when it is politically opportune. So, in our public political discourse, we may find his loyal supporters and we can divide them into these two groups, one who can uh, repeat his aphorisms in a kind of disconnected manner and those who will parade their loyalty to Lohia only when it is 
politically opportune for them. Even the small sincere groups and individual whose loyalty cannot be questioned are of no use so long as they remain mere worshippers of Lohiyas celebrating his birth and dead days and parroting some of his witty sayings. So, without critically engaging with uh, his thoughts, even the loyal uh, supporters of uh, Lohia remain entrapped in worshipping his birthdays and dead days and uh, remarking some of, uh, repeating some of his witty remarks about Indian politics, society, the challenges before the Indian society and, and so on. So, there is a kind of silence or conspicuous silence about engaging with Lohia and his thought or his politics uh, critically. So, uh, the, um, uh, the absence of such critical engagement do not allow us to understand the subtle or kind of uh, uh, emancipatory prospects or politics that Lohia was arguing arguing for in uh, his active, uh, active political life. So, the complexity as well as the relevance of Lohia's thought and ideals have led scholars and his followers deferred on many grounds and uh, some of the readings that we have provided and I uh, will uh, tell you again will help you to understand such disagreements or uh, difference of opinion about many of Lohia's positions and views on caste, class, socialism or Indian languages. It is also true that many political parties, many mainstream political parties and even radical groups derive their inspiration from the life and works of Lohia. However, it is high time to critically engage with his thoughts and ideas that is something which will enable us to retrieve some of the liberatory or emancipatory potentials or ideas that is there in Lohia's thought. So, it is now high time besides the uncritical or ineffective engagement with Lohia as many of his uh, loyal, uh, loyal followers or supporters are doing or a kind of conspicuous silence on the part of his scholars to not to engage with the culturally sensitive or rooted political activist and thinker like Lohia and subject, it, uh, subject him to critical scrutiny. Now, the time is to critically uh, sub, uh, uh, engage with Lohia and subject his ideas to the um, uh, to critical scrutiny and retrieve some of the potential um, uh, liberatory or emancipatory ideals that was there in terms of thinking about how to democratize the society and how to fight the privilege and the hierarchy or inequality in society by fighting simultaneously on many fronts, not by uh, reducing it to one kind of fight against the other. So, he was talking about a kind of popular um, popular uh, um, uh, front against the kind of hierarchies that is inbuilt in Indian, uh, Indian society and how to democratize that society, how to bridge the gap between those who are privileged and those who are excluded from the corridors and the positions of power. That remains something very substantial, something very relevant in Lohia's thought which can help us to make our society, our polity, our democracy more inclusive, more empowering. So, that is all on Lohia's. The themes that we have discussed today, you can refer to some of these works by Raman or Lohia on language and then some of the readings from the EPW. So, Yogendra Yadav was Lohia parochial and monolingual. Again from Yogendra Yadav, what is living and what is dead in Raman or Lohia and also on remembering Lohia. These are the texts you can refer to and by Sudhanwa Deshpande and Yogendra Yadav, Lohia and language with rejoinder you can refer to understand specifically the core arguments of Lohia about the uh, language and then context, discourse and vision of Lohia socialism by Raja Ram Tulpadi. These are some of the text which you can refer to on Lohia. So, that is all on Lohia. Thanks for listening. Thank you all.